Good morning and welcome to LUMC's weekly worship service. We're so happy to have you join us this morning as we begin our brand new series, God on Film. Today, Pastor Brandon is going to be drawing upon the movie Fast and Furious 10 and helping us to see what God tells us to do when our lives get a little fast and furious. But before that, we're going to begin our service with some music. Join me and let's sing together. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. Slain for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Oh, oh, oh. So open up the gates, make way. Is here to set the captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him we're gonna sing for who can stop the lord for who can stop the lord oh my stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? can stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before
Amen. Now, before we get into the rest of our service, I'd like to share with you a few announcements. Right now, take a look at that button on the right that says Connection Card. Go ahead and click that button and fill one out, even if you'd filled one out before. The Connection Card is a great resource. It's a way to register your attendance and let us know that you're here with us today. It's a great way to take next steps and sign up for activities in the church. And most importantly, it's a way to share your prayer requests with us. Every Monday, Pastor Brandon prays over all of the prayer requests we get and will reach out to you to let you know that he's prayed for you. So please take a moment right now to fill that out. Now, after you've done that, go ahead and click that link that says Give Online. Every week, our church is blessed to be able to change lives through our online ministry, like this worship service, and through our work in the community. That impact is made possible through your gifts, so thank you for giving. And if you'd like to continue to support the work of LUMC, click that link and you'll see a variety of ways that you can give. Finally, next week is a big Sunday at our church. We'll be honoring all of our recent graduates and confirmands with a special picnic after church. There'll be burgers and hot dogs, games for the kids, and much more. If you'd like to attend and would like to bring a side dish or dessert, just select the box when you'll fill out your connection card. Now, for this week's message, Pastor Brandon is going to be drawing upon the movie Fast and Furious 10 and helping us to see what God tells us to do when our lives get a little too fast and furious. Let's watch. Okay, so today we're kicking off our brand new series, God on Film, where we look at the summer's hottest movies and draw themes from them that help us to grow in our relationship with Jesus. And today we're looking at one of the biggest hits of the summer, Fast and Furious 10. And so let's begin by watching the trailer. He's coming for you with everything. What's the plan, Dom? I'm not sure anymore. One of us might not come back from this, but we have to fight. Never accept death. When suffering is old. All the dangerous. Ain't too many get bang with us. Label us no us. It's a setup. He's trying to tear us apart. Our situation is tight one. What you gonna do? Fight or run? Winning used to be about winning. We raced for respect. Today, I raced to stop the bloodbath. That's the problem with having such a big family. How do you choose the ones you save? Let's race! You still know how to drive? What do you think? It's showtime. Here we go. Game recognizes game. I'm coming for you, son. Here they come. You will never be able to break my family. No! So as you can tell, just by the trailer, just by the title, this movie is all about being fast, being intense, being tenacious. And let's be honest, right? That's why people love it. They're not coming to watch cars drive slowly and safely, right? They're not driving their grandma's Ford Taurus station wagon in the movie. Vin Diesel isn't doing turn signals with his hands out the window and rambling about his car's safety features. The key is go faster, right? That's what we love in our culture. Go faster, do more. But what about when we just can't handle that anymore? 
right? Anyone feel like your life is just going too fast? Do you wish that you could just slow down a little? Do you feel like maybe things are a little bit out of control? You're a little bit out of breath. You just wish that you could rest. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what to do when life is too fast and furious and how we can take steps to truly rest. And to begin, let's start with a moment when some people think Jesus is doing things and being a little too fast and furious himself. In Mark chapter 2, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. Now, one thing we have to understand is that the Sabbath was very strict. It was a very strict thing that the Jews observed in Jesus' day. Right? There were an entire set of rules that people were dedicated to about what you could or couldn't do on the Sabbath. And people knew they were supposed to rest on the Sabbath, but the question eventually became, how do you define rest? So the rabbis came up with a list of rules that they passed down from generation to generation. Right, How many steps you could take on the Sabbath? Was or wasn't it considered work if you milked your cow or things like that? And these rules were strict. And if you were a good Jew, you followed them. But apparently Jesus' followers aren't good Jews by that definition, because here they are picking heads of grain, which is a no-no on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, call them on it. Right? Mark says, the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Now, the David that Jesus is talking about here is King David, the great king of the Old Testament that we hear about in the book of 2 Samuel. David was believed to be the greatest of all the Jewish kings ever to live. And more importantly, he had a reputation for being highly favored by God and was said to be a man after God's own heart. He would have been revered by every Jew, right? Pharisees included. So David is Jesus's ace in the hole. Jesus is saying, you criticize my disciples for doing something unlawful on the Sabbath. And yet King David, whom you revere, did the same thing, possibly something even worse. How do you respond to that? And then Jesus finishes up by teaching the Pharisees a little something about the Sabbath, right? Mark says, then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, I want you to pay close attention to the first part of that. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What Jesus is saying here is that Sabbath isn't supposed to be a set of rules that we follow out of obligation. The Sabbath is a gift from God. It's a gift that God allows us to rest, right? And let's be clear, this was something unique to the Jewish people in Jesus's day. These days, we're accustomed to two-day weekends, right? We believe that we're entitled to it. But in Jesus's day, and long before that, there was no weekend, right? People work seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. But not the Jewish people. They rested. Right? People thought they were crazy. They actually took a whole day off and didn't do anything. People were like, how can you survive, right? Who, who cooks your food? Who tends your fields? How do you watch NASCAR, right? And the crazy thing is, 2,000 years later, even when society tries to help us by giving us not one, but two days off each week, we still don't know how to rest. We still don't observe a Sabbath. I mean, let me ask you, right? When was the last time you truly rested? And, and I don't just mean like, when was the last time you slept, right? Or laid on the couch or took a vacation. I mean, let's be honest, we can do all of those things and still not rest. I'm asking you, when was the last time you actually rested? Let your mind relax. Let your body relax. Cut off all the distractions and the responsibilities. Let your kids be bored for a little while. Let that call go to voicemail. Locked your husband in a room for a little while, right? And just rested. See, Jesus describes the Sabbath as God's gift to us because we need the Sabbath. We need time each week when we stop checking a to-do list, stop running from place to place, a space of empty time that we don't fill with yet something else to do. And we know this because Jesus himself does it. I want you to see what Luke tells us about Jesus. Yet the news about him spread all the more 
So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And this actually leads us to our first lesson today, which is lesson one, Jesus rested. Now think about this. What is Jesus's job? He's a rabbi. He's a teacher who has disciples and teaches crowds. He doesn't get a salary for this. His survival is based on the generosity of others. So he needs crowds in order to survive. But what do these verses say? It says that even though crowds of people flock to him, he often withdrew to be by himself and to pray. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, I don't have time to rest, right? I have to work and make a living. And Jesus responds, so did I, right? Or you might say, I can't rest. People are counting on me. And Jesus says, me too, right? Or you might say, I just don't have time to rest. There's too much going on. To which Jesus responds, neither did I, but I made it happen. I mean, just think about how big of a deal this is. Jesus is God in human form. He is our Savior, our Messiah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if he finds it important to set aside time to rest, to push past all the excuses, then so should we, right? If he finds it that important, then we should too. And what is so essential here is that we realize that this is a mindset shift. We're making rest a priority because we realize that rest isn't so that we can fill our cups back up. Rest is so that we can begin each day, each season with our cup already full. And this is so important, right? Let me illustrate it for you so you really understand what this looks like. For most of us, this is how we begin our week. Our cup is half full. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but the truth is we begin our weeks already a little bit drained. We overdid it the week before and we never got enough rest over the weekend to fill back up. And as we go throughout the week, we continue to pour out of our cup. We pour into our kids, into our marriage, into our friendships, our jobs, into our relationship with Jesus. We pour time into other people's opinions or the stress of school or even things that we know don't really matter. But by the end of the week, our cup is virtually empty. So we look to the weekend to fill ourselves back up. But our weekends and evenings and other opportunities for rest are already so full of other things, places where we have to keep pouring out. So by the end of the weekend, while we did replenish some, we begin the next week only half full again. When we truly Sabbath though, the whole situation looks different. We begin the week with a full cup, and as we go throughout the week, we pour out like we do now. We pour into our kids, our friends, stress and other things just like before, but we are pouring from a much fuller cup. And for the most part, we end the week with our cups still very full. Even though we poured out the same amount, we end with much more. Now, sometimes we might even have weeks where we pour out way more than half of our cup. We might even empty our cup. But on our Sabbath, we rest. We truly rest allow God to pour back into us. We rest for the week ahead rather than from the week we had. And we find that our cup becomes full again. Not just a little full, but completely full. Which gives us more to pour into the week ahead. More to invest in other people. And more for God to use for God's purposes. And it's all possible because of rest. It's essential that we begin each week with rest. But here's the thing, right? It's not enough just to set aside time to rest. We also have to know how to rest, right? This is where Jesus teaches us our final and most important and most powerful lesson. Because lesson number two is we must learn to rest in rather than to rest from or to rest for. See, the truth is we can never refill our cup. I mean, how many times have you gone on a vacation just to come back more exhausted than you were when you left, right? Or maybe you did get some rest, but it felt like it all disappeared as soon as the stresses of home and work popped up again. I mean, there's no amount of resting from exhaustion or resting in preparation for something that will truly give us peace. And so instead, Jesus shows us something that is more essential than either of those. Jesus teaches us to rest in. And let me show you where it says this. 
right? In John's gospel, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. Remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, notice what Jesus says, right? He says, a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, what Jesus is revealing to us here is that we want to try to avoid resting from, right? It's better to rest for, but what truly gives us life and strength is to rest in. Jesus is saying rest in in me, abide in me, surrender yourself fully to me. Let me be your strength, right? Just like a vine nourishes and sustains the branch, let me nourish and sustain you. In other words, Jesus is saying, let me be your savior and your Lord. Because in the end, that's what Sabbath is really about. That's what everything is about, right? It's about letting Jesus truly be your savior and your Lord. It's saying no amount of work that I do is going to save me. No lack of sleep is going to bring everything in my life in order. My to-do list is endless, and I will never feel satisfied that everything is done. But that's okay. Because my true satisfaction isn't found in my to-do lists or my accomplishments or my exhaustion. It's found in Jesus. He's the one who can sustain me. He's the one who can save me. So if I'm going to surrender to anything in my life, if anything is going to be my Lord, It's not going to be my to-do list or my job or other people's expectations of me or my own expectations of myself. If anything is going to be my Lord, it's going to be him. And so let me ask you, what do you need to surrender to Jesus? What are you holding back? What are you trying to accomplish yourself to make your life feel complete? What's exhausting you or draining you? And you just need to relinquish it to Jesus. Where are you finding that you're just moving too fast and too furiously and instead you need to let go and just abide in him, rest in him and trust that he is the one who can give you life? Well, it's on that note of surrender and resting in God that I really want to end this message today. I want to do so by praying a prayer of surrender, a prayer called the Wesley Covenant Prayer. And as you pray this, I want you to think about the words. Think about what it is you need to relinquish to God. Where in your life you need to abide in Jesus and just rest in him. I want to challenge you to give that up to him as you pray. And so let's join together right now and let's pray this prayer of surrender. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Yeah.
Well, that's it for our service today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to check out those links to the side and down below. Fill out a connection card, sign up for a group, and give online. We're so glad that you decided to be with us today, and we'd like to personally invite you back next week as we continue our series, God on Film. Today, we're going to end with one of our special benediction songs. So let's join together and sing. <laughs>